It's time to reclaim Brewer Rabbit. You may have seen Once Upon a Studio, Disney's short film celebrating 100 years of animation, and Brewer Rabbit is missing. You might think you know why he is missing. You might even think you know this character. The real story is quite different. He goes by many names. Brother Rabbit, Bra Rabbit, Bruda Rabbit, and Brewer Rabbit. But where did he come from, and who framed Brewer Rabbit? Today is the last day of Splash Mountain. Most of us know Br'er Rabbit from the famous, but now closed, Disney ride Splash Mountain. Some of you may know Br'er Rabbit from the band Disney film Song of the South, but even still, some of you may know him from the Uncle Remus stories published over 100 years ago. Here's the twist. None of those are the origins of Br'er Rabbit. However, you know Brother Rabbit, you may not know that Br'er Rabbit tales originate from African-American folklore. But if you rode Splash Mountain, I bet the last thing you thought about were stories from American slavery. But there's more. More. Among all this talk about Splash Mountain, does Burr Rabbit have to get thrown out with the bathwater? How can a beloved character cause so much controversy? This is a hare. Various cultures in Central, West, and Southern Africa have used this animal as an inspiration for folk tales. These tales went to the Americas during the middle passage of the triangular trade and evolved into the Br'er Rabbit stories we know today. Br'er Rabbit folk tales were part of an oral tradition passed down from person to person and not written down. Enslaved folks kept these tales to themselves. But why? Well, Br'er Rabbit folk tales contained lessons on how to outsmart the plantation masters. There are countless stories that tell of the exploits of this trickster bunny, who though small and weak, constantly outwits bigger and fiercer creatures such as Br'er Fox, Br'er Wolf, and Br'er Bear. Although not always successful, Br'er Rabbit represents a subversive folk hero who used intelligence against brute force. Replace Br'er Rabbit with an enslaved person, Br'er Fox with the plantation master, and Br'er Bear with the overseer, and you can imagine how these tales held high esteem on the plantation. But don't take my word for it. Of these beloved animal legends told on the plantations by the old Negro storytellers, who had been handing them down from generation to generation. That's Walt Disney in 1956, a decade after Song of the South was released. We'll get into that later. These stories were about subverting the plantation, but how did these tales become bedtime stories told on these exact plantations and even a worldwide sensation that inspired Walt Disney? The answer is complicated. Folklorists and conservationists transcribe these stories from the plantation after the American Civil War. Some like Alcee Fortier in New Orleans and Joel Chandler Harris in Georgia heard these stories in childhood from enslaved folks, and they would retell these tales as adults to varying success. But Joel Chandler Harris was the most well-known because he framed these Brewer Rabbit folk tales with a narrator. Joel Chandler Harris was the one who created Uncle Remus, a composite character of formerly enslaved men who told Joel these folktales as a boy. In Joel Chandler Harris's folktales, Uncle Remus retold these Burr Rabbit tales to a fictional young boy whose parents owned the plantation. Now Joel Chandler Harris did not grow up with means. He worked as a printer's apprentice on the Turnworld Plantation, where he spent his off time with the enslaved in the cabins. And as a man, he would revisit these stories and publish them. Joel Chandler Harris credited Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin with influencing his decision to create Uncle Remus. But Uncle Tom's Cabin was an anti-slavery narrative that showed the atrocities of slavery, unlike the Uncle Tom stereotype that would evolve later. The original book sees Uncle Tom as a Christian man who sacrifices himself to save the lives of two women runaway slaves. He wasn't someone who threw black folks under the bus for his gain, like this guy. But where did this come from? When Uncle Tom's Cabin came out in 1852, many pro-slavery advocates dismissed it as exaggerating the horrors of slavery. The play became very popular in blackface minstrel shows, and many of these shows removed the part of Uncle Tom sacrificing himself for the runaway slaves, and instead revealed Uncle Tom as a docile and passive enslaved person who would throw others under the bus to please the master. It is this misrepresentation of the character from the book that would become what modern audiences now associate with Uncle Tom. By the time Joel Chandler Harris published the first Uncle Remus story in 1876, Uncle Tom was firmly placed in the minstrel show tradition. And it was from this that Joel based Uncle Remus. 
but unlike Uncle Tom's cabin, Joel was not interested in detailing any of the atrocities of slavery. Harris would say himself, what days they were, those days on the old plantation. These Uncle Remus stories painted plantation life as happy. But why would any enslaved person share these stories with folklorists? And Wyatt Walker, chief of staff for Martin Luther King, said it best in this interview. Just the pure joy of saying one thing that you knew he wanted to hear and really meaning something else, you know. Uh, even the folklore. Uh, yes. Even Uncle Remus. Yes, uh-huh. Uh, poking fun at the master without the master ever really understanding what he was saying. And so now these trickster tales that were about subverting plantation life are packaged in a way that makes them more acceptable to audiences still on the fence about the horrors of slavery. But both versions of Burr Rabbit, the Burr Rabbit that was a subversive folklore hero and the Burr Rabbit that was packaged as an extension of plantation life, existed at the same time. Introducing Bower Rabbit, the contested trickster. Joel's Uncle Remus stories were an instant international success, and they were huge. Joel Chandler Harris's Breer Rabbit Tales inspired the creation of Peter Rabbit and Bugs Bunny. Authors like Mark Twain and Rudyard Kipling, Disney bought the rights to his story and made Song of the South, published a series of children's books and comic strips about Uncle Remus's tales that ran for decades and were translated in countless languages, and 40 years after the film's release, would open a ride based on the movie and these tales called Splash Mountain. But it wasn't just all a one-way retelling, there was pushback. As early as 1899, less than two decades after the publication of the first Uncle Remus book, African-American authors were reframing Uncle Remus to be more direct in asking for what he wanted. An early rebuttal to Uncle Remus's tales appears in The Southern Workman, a publication from the Hampton Institute's Folklore Society. You can see our retelling of this Breer Rabbit story in the link above. All this talk about Joel Chandler Harris's books, let's look at the actual text. Notice anything? Joel wrote the tales in his interpretation of the deep South African American dialect of the time. Brother would become Brewer or Brew. Joel Chandler Harris's use of dialect became a sensation. An entire international industry popped up around publishing tales told in authentic dialect. Among African American writers and authors, the reaction to Harris's use of dialect was mixed. Later African American authors like Charles Chestnut and Zora Neale Hurston would continue this tradition in their writing. Charles Chestnut would create a response to Uncle Remus with his Uncle Julius, who was himself a trickster, who would tell stories to northerners who moved south while always making sure he came out ahead of any tale he spun. While some appreciated the authentic representation, Others criticized it for perpetuating stereotypes. This debate continues to be discussed among literary critics and historians. The interpretation of these Uncle Remus tales differed along regional and cultural lines. Northerners viewed the dialect and the Uncle Remus stories as a revelation. They were introduced to little-known characters and life conditions that were foreign to their experiences. The stories were perceived as making the life of the Old South familiar and charming to Northern readers, which significantly influenced and softened Northern opinions about the South. In contrast, Southern audiences appreciated Harris's work for its authentic representation of a dialect they recognized, and for portraying slaves as people, rather than just a problem. Uncle Remus became shorthand for Br'er Rabbit tales. So now, Br'er Rabbit and Uncle Remus are tied together. And it is this framing that authors and Disney would be navigating to the present day. Bringing this back to Br'er Rabbit, revisit some of the tales. And while Br'er Rabbit uses his wits, he's not above responding with violence when facing Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear. Even in Joel Chandler Harris's stories of Br'er Rabbit, he concludes his first book with a story about Br'er Rabbit cutting off the head of Br'er Fox and delivering it to Br'er Fox's family. In other words, these were not just happy-go-lucky stories. There were hints of something darker buried within them. What is the meaning of the Tar Baby story? You see, Br'er Fox knows Br'er Rabbit has been coming into his garden and stealing his plants. So Br'er Fox creates a doll out of tar and turpentine. Br'er Rabbit tries to communicate with the doll, and when the doll doesn't respond, Br'er Rabbit strikes the doll, resulting in him becoming stuck. This is precisely what Br'er Fox wants, who, seeing the trapped rabbit, comes to capture him and prepare him for dinner. Well, 
in the story published by Joel Chandler Harris, we don't know what happens to our beloved Brewer Rabbit. In other tales, it finishes with him convincing Brewer Fox to throw him in the Briar Patch, a place Brewer Rabbit knows all too well. But what if I told you the Tar Baby story is a tale about who gets access to food? In Frederick Douglass's autobiography, he recounted a story where a former plantation master guarded his food from the enslaved folks by covering a fence with tar, and if someone tried to take the food, and there was tar on their body, they would be beaten. This parallel to the Tar Baby story is just one example of how Burr Rabbit Tales paralleled real life and death conditions of those who were enslaved. Well, how did this story become so controversial? Well, Tar Baby would become a derogatory term used to describe black people, and specifically black children. Phrases like, someone was touched with tar, was a way to say they may appear white, but they are black. Here again, we see how these Burr Rabbit Tales lead to contested meanings depending on who is telling the tale. Let's fast forward to the 1980s. Disney is about to unveil Splash Mountain. But even in the 80s, Uncle Remus was seen as an antiquated relic. Disney would decide to remove any reference to Uncle Remus and the Tar Baby in the final design of Splash Mountain, instead making Brer Frog the quasi-narrator of the ride in place of Uncle Remus. You may imagine removing Uncle Remus and exchanging the Tar Baby for a honeypot would be enough to decrease the controversy around this ride. Not quite because Disney made one key mistake when dealing with this trickster bro rabbit that would still haunt them to this day. Brer Rabbit tales have been used to both reinforce racist stereotypes and celebrate African-American resilience. The stories about Brer Rabbit didn't stop evolving after slavery ended. African-American authors like Ralph Ellison, Nella Larson, and Toni Morrison reclaimed Brer Rabbit, using him to address issues like segregation, racism, and sexism. Both Invisible Man and Passing deserve their own videos, but they show that even after slavery ended, the use of the trickster in African-American literature was alive and well during the early 20th century. In 2021, the Netflix film Passing would retell the 1929 book written by Nella Larsons. In the original book, the relationship between Claire and Irene drew parallels to the Burrow Rabbit folktales. In the story, both Irene and Claire can pass for white, giving them access to status. These two characters are both tricksters, who use their appearances to navigate their station in life, and to try to wring out a better position, even if it means alienating themselves from other black people. Irene has married a white man and never shares that she is black, which is a dangerous game. In the context of Brer Rabbit, we can see here how navigating racism in 1929 Harlem, by passing for white, give certain black people a chance to subvert the social position of their race during that time, if only temporarily. In Nella Larson's passing, it is said that Tar touches Claire. This was a derogatory way to say that a person had some African-American ancestry, especially in a world where people are passing for white. But W.E.B. Du Bois recognized the importance of giving positive images of these folk tales for black children, and he created the Brownies book, which was meant to give all children a positive and uplifting presentation of themselves. Children even participated in telling Br'er Rabbit stories too, although it was only around for less than a year. It shows that Br'er Rabbit stories were still being crafted. Oh, and what was Disney's mistake they made about Br'er Rabbit? Disney would describe Br'er Rabbit as happy-go-lucky, framing Br'er Rabbit as a harmless trickster, not the complicated folk hero he actually is. Joel also recognized in his first Uncle Remus story that these Br'er Rabbit tales stood for the dynamics between slave and master on the plantation. And as Uncle Remus once said, if these tales were just for fun and giggles, he wouldn't have bothered telling them at all. Disney's version of these Uncle Remus stories would remove this edge found in the original text. To ensure films would play to Southern audiences, Hollywood producers would adopt stories and themes that reinforce Jim Crow segregation. The success of Gone with the Wind left many producers in Hollywood wanting a piece of the action, and within a year of Gone with the Wind's premiere, Walt Disney would secure the rights to Joel Chandler Harris's Uncle Remus stories. Disney went all in on these folktales, but a year prior to Song of the South's release, Disney would publish a weekly comic strip of Uncle Remus stories. Disney did this with other films pre-release like Snow White and Dumbo, 
but the Uncle Remus stories were different because these comic strips ran for over three decades after the film's release. The Jim Crow era film, Song of the South, would take Joel Chandler Harris's framing and disnify Burr Rabbit. In the movie, although it occurs after the American Civil War, it's hard to tell if this is during slavery or afterward. Much has been said about Song of the South, and this video is about Burr Rabbit. But for all of its technological achievements, and the fact that its main character, James Baskett, would be the first African-American male to win an Oscar for his role as Uncle Remus, the film is not available to view. The premiere of Song of the South was in Atlanta, Georgia, and the African-American actors were not invited because of segregation laws. During the making of the film, Disney would consult with members of the NAACP, but stopped short of letting them read the script. He even hired a writer to help give a more balanced view of the South at the time. However, the finished film leaned into a more romanticized vision of plantation life. I guess if it worked for Gone with the wind, it would work for Disney. Disney would say, I think Remus is a great character, a strong character. He is the dominant force in the story. There is no reason for Negroes to take offense. Disney would later campaign for James Baskett's honorary Oscar. Disney would retell three Br'er Rabbit tales in Song of the South. Br'er Rabbit makes a dollar a minute, the wonderful Tar Baby story and Br'er Rabbit laughing place. It's hard to imagine just how popular Br'er Rabbit was over the past century. Even Stephen King would get in on these Br'er Rabbit tales in Misery, where the protagonist refers to the laughing place as the sinister location for the remains of her victims. Br'er Rabbit appeared on molasses, comic books, political cartoons. His Tar Baby folktale would evolve into a metaphor for being in a sticky situation and then evolve to a darker meaning altogether. African-American writers and folklorists have used Joel Chandler Harris's stories to reconfigure the cultural narrative, removing the stereotypes and the racist dialect. So the African-American community began to protest these portrayals. Remember at the beginning of the video, we asked, where did you hear these Br'er Rabbit stories from? Well, some folks heard these tales from their grandparents and parents, based down from African-American oral traditions. And to them, Joel Chandler Harris and Disney's versions felt like theft. Alice Walker, the author of The Color Purple, and a native of Eatonton like Joel Chandler Harris claimed that Song of the South killed Br'er Rabbit for her as a child. We no longer listen to them. Both of my parents were excellent storytellers, and wherever we lived, no matter how poor the house, we had fireplaces and a front porch. It was around the fireplaces and on the porch that I first heard, from my parents' lips, my mother filling in my father's pauses, and he filling in hers, the stories that I later learned were Uncle Remus stories. Alice Walker, protests and rebuttals to Joel Chandler Harris's rendition continue to this day. Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man delved into the impact of Uncle Remus books, and this connection can deepen our understanding of the historic novel Invisible Man. Ellison referenced the characters of the Uncle Remus books in Chapter 11, but it wasn't just a simple mention. After the narrator awakens in a factory hospital and undergoes electroshocks, a doctor asks him, Boy, who was Burr Rabbit? This question might seem harmless, but it can highlights the inescapable cultural bind the narrator has with the South. Briar Rabbit symbolizes the struggle between African Americans and the dominant power structure. So when Briar Rabbit uses his wits to overcome adversity, it mirrors the tactics African Americans must employ against the oppressive Jim Crow society. Both undertake extreme measures in response to extreme circumstances, and they act out of necessity. Emily Zobel Marshall's book, American Trickster, delves deep into the history of Briar Rabbit. But it's not just a historical account, it showcases how these tales have been used for political ends, sometimes even opposing ones. Malcolm Gladwell devoted a whole chapter of his book, David and Goliath, to how Br'er Rabbit influenced the civil rights movement strategy. But let's take a closer look. This iconic image captures the legend of Br'er Rabbit. Wyatt Walker, a strategist for Martin Luther King Jr., understood, like Br'er Rabbit, the need to outsmart the opposition, so he crafted protests that highlighted the absurdity of segregation. You see, folktales are more than just stories we tell. They can reflect secrets on surviving forces bigger than ourselves. But even still, this was no children's tale. Birmingham was the perfect stage for this modern-day trickster tale. Coming to Birmingham was a dangerous decision for those involved. Many didn't think they'd see their families again when they arrived. Churches did not want King to speak for fear of bombings. 
and the black community of Birmingham was tired of the oppressive Jim Crow laws. Bull Connor, with his blatant racism, played into the hands of civil rights activists by embodying the brute force that Brer Rabbit always outsmarted. So when the world saw the calm boy in the photograph, it was not just witnessing a moment of brutality, but a strategic exposure of injustice. Called Project C, the C for confrontation, used nonviolent actions to provoke media coverage and federal attention. Children were used in demonstrations, facing violence and arrest to fill jails and create a moral crisis to bring pressure to create change. Many demonstrations started at the 16th Street Baptist Church. Not everyone agreed with the inclusion of children, it's important to remember, people suffered lifelong injuries in these demonstrations, with hearing loss from the high-powered hoses being just one example. The nonviolent protesters needed to appear almost saintly to gain sympathy from national media. But as Wyatt Walker said in later interviews, the patience for nonviolent responses was running low, and folks were ready to defend their rights and themselves. Walter had been raised around big dogs and knew how to protect himself. Look at Walter's left leg. He's putting distance between him and the dog. See Walter's hand. He's holding the officer's forearm, steadying himself. But even with this picture, the federal government was slow to act. The success of the SCLC's nonviolent protest had integrated schools in Birmingham. But in retaliation, all students who had protested were expelled from school. Walker told Robert Kennedy that protesters were tired of the beatings and abuse and might turn violent if federal support didn't come in Birmingham. The threat of violent retaliation from protesters motivated JFK to intervene. Less than six months after this picture was taken, four little girls were killed in a bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, the same church where these demonstrations started. The civil rights movement would change how Americans engaged with stories told from earlier in America's history. But times were changing, and by the 1970s, Uncle Remus was seen in a different light, if not mentioned at all. Frank Zappa and George Duke wrote the song Uncle Remus for Zappa's 1974 album. This song was about civil rights and racism in America. During the exploitation era, animator Ralph Bakshi made Coonskin. His retelling of Br'er Rabbit was controversial, and was even dropped by its distributor, after protests from black groups. Coonskin addresses racism by telling an updated version of Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox, and Br'er Bear, who navigate the streets of Harlem among episodic stories about American racism. In the 80s, Chevy Chase would do a riff on Uncle Remus, where animated animals visited him on a plantation with a chorus of slaves. Morrison, in particular, incorporated Br'er Rabbit in her novels Jazz, Love, and Tar Baby. But she didn't just use him as a character, she showcased the resilience and adaptability of African Americans through his tales. Toni Morrison said, For me, the tar baby came to mean the black woman who can hold things together. Specifically, Morrison is able to celebrate the richness of trickster narration and explore the potential of trickster tactics to overcome reductive views of black femininity. You've been like an uncle to me, like a kind old Uncle Remus. But is all this just a matter of interpretation, or was there something a bit more sinister to the framing of these Br'er Rabbit tales? But what was going on in the world when Joel published these stories? Imagine you're around after the American Civil War, and over four million former slaves are now free. How do you integrate them into this new world? Newly freed black Americans participated in creating this new country by playing an active role in Congress and the Senate. This time is known as Reconstruction, and it followed the period immediately after slavery. While the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were added to the Constitution to give newly freed slaves more legal protections, the U.S. Army was sent to Confederate states to enforce these new laws, even requiring former Confederate states to agree to these new terms to join the Union. And there was backlash. By 1872, a new philosophy called the New South appeared and the Atlanta Constitution was its primary publication touting the benefit of a new South that would regain a sense of self-respect for Southerners by ensuring newly freed blacks were second-class citizens, and Joel Chandler Harris was its assistant editor and lead editorial writer of the Constitution. It was in this paper that Joel would publish his first Uncle Remus stories. But if you look at the Uncle Remus stories, 
it seems that black people were happy to be on the plantation. When the strides made by newly freed citizens suggest that was not the aspiration of the time. As well, a narrative began to spread that slavery may not have been that bad. Some would go as far to say slaves were happy because they sang. Really? Northern intellectuals and history books would continue to promote this idea. Although Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth had already chronicled the horrors of slavery, the overthrow of Reconstruction would see an increase in efforts to reframe the contributions of African Americans in this country. This matters because Joel Chandler Harris's first Uncle Remus story was published in 1879 in the Atlanta Constitution, only two years after the Compromise of 1877, when the federal government left the South and gave Southern states autonomy to institute laws that would be the precursor to the Jim Crow segregation laws. Even though the New South was a proposed business relationship, where the industrialization of the North would come south to build new industries, it never took off as expected. Its leader, William Grady, would die young, and Joel Chandler Harris, a close friend, would give his eulogy at the funeral. But even with the economic failure of the New South, the cultural influence of the South would live far longer than any business arrangement. So it's within this context that folklorists in the 19th century collected Br'er Rabbit tales, but many of them obscured the contributions of their African-American informants, leading to a skewed representation. Some had a hard time acknowledging the African origins of Br'er Rabbit, instead attributing to European, Indian, and Native American prototypes of these Br'er Rabbit folk tales. And although various cultures would influence these tales during slavery, the origins of these stories originate overwhelmingly in Africa. Although Joel Chandler Harris acknowledged the African origins of these tales, his framing of an idyllic plantation experience complicates his retelling. But let's look at the cultural influences of the American stories of Br'er Rabbit. Br'er Rabbit's Caribbean counterpart, Anansi the Spider, shares similar tales, although their cultural trajectories are distinct. Despite the various portrayals of Br'er Rabbit over the years, his essence as a trickster remains. The Marvel character Kwaku Anansi is inspired by these Anansi folktales, and fans of American gods will remember Mr. Nancy. In New Orleans, Br'er Rabbit is also known as Compère Lapin, a French Creole retelling of Br'er Rabbit. The origins of the Tar Baby story are diverse. Various cultures around the world have a similar tale of a trickster character being tied to a sticky object that only becomes more complicated with more interactions. Br'er Rabbit wasn't the only trickster told in African-American folktales. John and Old Master tales also highlight how enslaved populations needed to use their wits to outsmart the plantation system. There were High John the Conqueror tales, stories of plantation witches and hoodoo practitioners, and other characters who provided psychological guidance on how to assert oneself through folktales. The way Br'er Rabbit is being erased feels like a mistake. Given all this rich history surrounding Brewer Rabbit and how he's been represented over the years, it's puzzling why Disney wouldn't have reimagined the character for modern times. Imagine, Disney could have remade a Brewer Rabbit tale without Uncle Remus. In 2006, Universal Home Video released The Adventures of Brewer Rabbit, with Nick Cannon voicing the titular character. This film did not include Uncle Remus, although it credits Joel Chandler Harris as an influence. Instead, Danny Glover serves the role of narrator as Br'er Turtle. This is one of the most recent examples of a feature film about Br'er Rabbit, updated not to include the Uncle Remus framework. Why wouldn't Disney do something similar? It seems the conversation around the influence of Song of the South in these folk tales is needed. It just won't be Disney leading that charge. Instead, Br'er Rabbit would make appearances in short-lived TV shows and occasional video games it seems like an opportunity was missed. And yet, because the mention of Br'er Rabbit is tied to Song of the South, we can only wonder what could have been had Disney retold Br'er Rabbit stories in all those years between Song of the South and the close of Splash Mountain. So, why are they getting rid of Splash Mountain? And was Splash Mountain racist? Over the years, Disney has tried to reshape the Br'er Rabbit story for modern times. They removed Uncle Remus from concepts for the ride, but the legacy of these folktales framed by Joel Chandler Harris and the subsequent Disney film Song of the South seem to cast too large a shadow for Disney to continue adopting. So, 
Bar Rabbit, and Song of the South all seem to be fading into the past. Regardless, it looks like Br'er Rabbit is leaving Disney's canon. Not only was he not in the centennial celebration of Disney animation, but his statues around various Disney parks have disappeared. But Splash Mountain lives on in one corner of the globe. As of November 2023, Tokyo Disneyland has no plans to retheme Splash Mountain, which makes me wonder, how long will Br'er Rabbit's adventures continue in Tokyo? But even keeping Splash Mountain up in Tokyo doesn't solve the problem that has plagued Disney's interpretation of Briar Rabbit in recent years. Before we dig into the last chapter, wanted to remind you to subscribe to the Legacy of Folktales, where we explore folktales and history to bring context to our modern world. If you're already subscribed, please hit the notification button so you can see the next video when it's ready. We love making these videos and seeing your comments. Thank you so much for your support so far. Now. Back to the last chapter. We said earlier you couldn't see any mention of slavery on Splash Mountain. And that's the problem. You can't remove Briar Rabbit from America's history of slavery, from his arrival to the Middle Passage, to his role in navigating Jim Crow segregation to his appearance in countless films, books, and cultural moments. Briar Rabbit is tied to America's dark history of slavery and the way this contested trickster evolves seems to evolve with how our country is grappling with this history. So regardless of what Disney does, or if there's a Splash Mountain or not, or if Disney includes Br'er Rabbit in Once Upon a Studio, his relevance in literature and American culture can't be denied. Disney's not the only one who can tell Barra Rabbit's story. Now that you've seen this video, how will you keep these trickster tales alive? If you enjoyed this deep dive into the origins and American adaptations of Burr Rabbit's tales, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and ring the notification bell so you never miss another epic story. Until next time, this is the legacy of African American folktales signing off. And remember, always use your wit and cunning.